Hello and welcome everyone to the second Bylines Network webinar. This one is entitled Democracy Under Fire. Tonight we have an excellent panel of speakers from the worlds of politics and journalism and it's great to see so many of our writers and editors here tonight as well. Thank you for everything you're doing to make this all possible. Democracy relies on people getting involved in the conversation at all levels and holding politicians to account. The Bylines Network is a platform for progressive voices. With over 500 writers, editors, web teams and social media teams, this is an incredible thing to be part of. The first of the regional bylines publications launched less than a year ago in Yorkshire at the start of the first lockdown. Since then, we've expanded to the Northeast, West Country, West England, Sussex and Kent. And our latest title, Central Bylines, brings together the existing team at East Midlands with a whole new team from the West Midlands and beyond. They're basically covering the middle of the country and it's looking really good so far. We plan to launch more bylines later in the year in East Anglia, the North West and Scotland and hopefully in Wales too. So if you're not already involved, please do make contact because we'd love to uh, bring you on to one of our teams. Many of you will know or know of Mike Goldsworthy from Scientists for EU. The Bylines Network came about following a conversation he had with Peter Dukes over a year ago, talking about the importance of participatory democracy and citizen journalism. This is something Peter is passionate about. So let me introduce our first speaker. Peter's an author, screenwriter and co-founder of Byline Times and the Byline Festival. After 25 years as a playwright and screenwriter for mainstream TV dramas, he came to prominence as a journalist for his live tweeting of the phone hacking trial in 2013. He has written for The Observer, Independent, New York Times, New Republic, Politico, Daily Beast and others. For those watching this on catch up, I should say that due to a fault in our system, we unfortunately didn't manage to record the beginning of Peter's talk, but we can pick it up just as he gets to the important part. If the journalism is the immune system, if you like, of the body politic, when that gets corrupted, then you're prone to other infections. Now, um, the two things I think very quickly have corrupted us and corrupted the media uh, is I put them down to two words, which I think I stole, stole from Stephen Kinnock. Anyway, I've been using on Byline Times for the last two years is dirty data and dark money. Dirty data, obviously, I'll get to Cambridge Analytica soon, but it's an ancient tradition of the press to be used as compromat, as hit jobs. Um, you know, if you see back sort of the Elizabethan times, actors stabbing each other because one had defamed them in a pamphlet. That is an old story. But what happens, particularly with Rupert Murdoch, but not only with him, is this gets industrialized. And then by the time you get to phone hacking, basically, the news of the world, and this wasn't the only intelligence operation on New Labour, but during the noughties had 27 ministers and there were spads regularly hacked. This is a Stasi-like operation. And what is that information useful? Sometimes for the public interest, sometimes to expose some scandal, but generally for coercion, bullying, blackmail and compromise. And if you look at the history of Murdoch, though he claims to be a free marketeer, basically games the regulator, he bullies politicians, he frightens them. And the epitome of this is it came out in a trial. People forget it wasn't a phone hacking trial alone. More trials about bribing public officials it was the black safe, the big safe that uh, it came out in the trial in Kingston, seven foot high safe in the sun, which is called the Black Museum, which is filled of compromising materials so and stuff that can never be published, but it's not in the public interest. But the threat of all those photographs, those documents, tapes, of David Blunkett talking about his child uh, were kept in these safes. And there's a classic story of Michael Wolfe, a biographer, talking to Murdoch, Murdoch's biographer. They fell out because he made quite an unflattering portrait. But what Murdoch would say, you go, they talk about a politician, anybody, you go, we got a photograph of him. And so what happened, the withholding of information or the intrusion on privacy became standard practice. And Long story behind this, Daniel Morgan murder. I or this panel report coming out. I urge you to listen to the podcast to understand why criminal the criminal media nexus, as Gordon Brown described it in 2011. But that was partly exposed by phone hacking, and to a certain extent, it didn't 
people didn't blackmail politicians over their phone messages anymore, or like having to Chris Bryant, you know, this would have heard police officers, if they if somebody rang the station, oh, I've been, you know, been burgled or something's happened, the sun would be there before the police, the police officer. That has kind of gone, but something else in a way worse has replaced it. And that's the obviously the dirty data of all the likes, dislikes, all the information, the 3,000 points of information Chris Wiley described to me that that particular organization, Cambridge Analytica, had on every voter in America. I'm part of a class action, I can't do against Facebook for the breaching of my data. I was one of the victims of This Is Your Digital Life, the, um, the Cambridge Analytica app, related app, which downloaded, if a fr my friend used it, downloaded all my data, or even my direct messages to them, and Facebook never told me. So I'm part of a class action, representative action against them. But what that allowed you to do, you could predict famously, I'll get the figures wrong, but after 100 likes on Facebook, you could predict um, them better than their friends, 200 better than their partner, and around 300 better than them themselves. But that data, you mix it with electoral register, you mix that with song likes, your Spotify playlist. Chris Wiley told me this you know, six months before it came out in The Observer, a terrifying vision of dirty data now being used to create a kind of private reality around individuals for targeted, it's not targeted advertising, it's targeted information. It's a fifth battle space, as Chris Wiley described it, which is the information space where you move the target into a different reality. We're seeing beyond Brexit, lots of signs on that now, obviously QAnon and the ins insurrection in the capital in January. We're also seeing it, I think, here with the Scandemic movement and you know, various other movements, where actually this is where we are seeing our reality, our shared reality being broken down. Uh, in a different way to how Rupert Murdoch would break down the reality of politicians. We are targeted by these ads, and as people notice if they get on social media, a bit like Rupert Murdoch, they will be threatened. Not by a tabloid press journalist knocking at the door, but somebody threatening. If you're a person of colour on social media, the death threats or the vague threats, the doxing, all that is insuperable. The other thing, which is the dark money. So right from the beginning, the danger of the media always was it was a tool of rich men to change the politics. It's only by about 1850 that you get a, an independent newspaper which is funded by advertising, the Times. And that model has gone. So you could, in the high days of the Times, the Sunday Times under Harold Evans, the Observer, you know, the good days of the Express, the good days of the Mail. You could say that in a way, these media organizations were above political influence because they were funded by advertising and advertisers have some pull, but you can always go to another advertiser. You see it go wrong with HSBC and the Telegraph. As why Peter Oborn left, they were big advertisers. The Telegraph, the Telegraph wouldn't run his stories about HSBC. But by and large, that was quite a stable system for some kind of independence generally, more in the US than here. But that's gone. Nobody makes any money in journalism anymore. All that advertising has been hoovered up billions of it every year by Facebook and Google, who don't produce news. So what we have, we're back to the problem of dark money. We constantly get, you know, who funds you, Jukes? Who funds you, Jukes? You know, so, well, the audience do. We have 12,000, 13,000 subscribers, it's great, 36 pounds uh, a year. You can see, you know, the economics of this. But the expectation is that a rich person will pay to get their reality set. And we're seeing it now with something like GB News, 60 million on this new news channel in the new UK, which has already said, according to Andrew Neil, this challenging woke culture. It's early presenters do not look like they're providing any kind of balance, but they don't need to because they are funded by Paul Marshall, uh, who runs a hedge fund, made, I think he made about 200 million out of Brexit and Pat Cording to um, Tim Shipman's book, he persuaded Gove to go for Brexit. He said statements about Black Lives Matter and the rest of the money comes from the Gartam, a capital fund based out of Dubai, um, and all the, a lot of the personnel are Australian. So this idea of GB News being a national news uh, is slightly ludicrous. And that goes just back to our problem. We have the problem of oligarchs moving into the media space, happened in Russia, happened in Ukraine, happened in Poland, happens in Hungary. 
it's the first thing they do in the information economy is try to control the flow of information about them particularly and the reality around them. Murdoch kind of set this up, you know, he, he is not a British citizen. He was allowed to own the news of the world, then the sun, and then allowed to take over the Times. So he had a monopoly position in Fleet Street, i.e. he had 40% of the circulation, 50% of the revenues, a price gouging monopoly situation without being a British citizen. To start up the Fox News Network, he had to become an American citizen. And that's why um, Reagan fast-tracked him. He had to sell the New York Post for a while because he wanted a TV station in New York. They have very, for this, the home of capitalism, they have stringent laws against market abuse and monopoly power in the media sector. And without sounding xenophobic, I really don't understand why most of the papers are owned by non-domicile for tax purposes, residents. I mean, just like a lot of Brexiteers left the shores, having pushed a Brexit and now moved to Europe, there is just a market failure. It's an externality that there is no consequences for their, their abuse of power. Uh, and both that dark money and that dirty data, I think together, especially in the digital space, is deeply corrosive of the shared reality. Even Biden talked about it, the shared truths. We need to organize a democracy. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's certainly from the Bylines Network perspective. Um, we're definitely not funded and paid. We take horrific uh, advantage of all our writers. I know many of you are watching tonight. Um, so thank you for that because um, you take the time and you write articles for us. But um, we work very closely with Byline Times as well in trying to expose that and support the, the media in the country that is, is still uh, pushing for truth and justice, etc. But it leads me nicely on to Tom Brake. Um, you've asked for, you know, what, what the sort of safeguards are, and then I think constitution might come up a little bit um, with our next speaker. So Tom is the director of Unlock Democracy, was an MP for Carl, is it Carl Shelton? Carl Shelton, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I've never actually said that, I do apologise. And Wallington from 1997 to 2019, where he was active in pushing for democratic reform. This included extending freedom of information laws to private companies like Circo and Capita, when they undertake work for the public sector. It also included defending UK elections from foreign interference and pushing for votes at 16. I don't know how much of that you'll cover today, but uh, welcome Tom and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. And uh, can I first of all congratulate Bylines for, for what you've achieved uh, in the last few months. It's uh, very impressive indeed to hear about the, the growth and so on. And can I also thank Peter for his, his words of praise. I think Peter said that uh, I was someone who stepped forward. Uh, unfortunately, the last time I stepped forward in the general election, I was shot down by my electorate, but that, that's the way these things work. Um, but uh, I fell on my feet and I'm very happy as the director of Unlock Democracy, an organization that campaigns on issues that are very close to my heart. So uh, the title of today was, Is Democracy Under Fire? And I want to, I guess, draw an analogy between uh, the state of a house and the state of our democracy. So some houses are condemned. I don't think our democracy is yet at that stage. Uh, other houses are, are houses that, that are ready to be moved into or perhaps just need a little bit of a makeover, uh, perhaps ripping out those 1970s 70s orange and avocado bathrooms, for instance. Uh, that's not the state of our democracy. Our democracy, I think, is in the state of the houses that you see uh, on that, uh, that show, the great uh, house giveaway. In other words, they are houses that, so it's a house that's uh, being sold at auction, which has some major structural issues with it. And that's not surprising because if you look at our democracy, many aspects of it are like many of our housing stock, uh, 70 years old. And uh, the services are, are 70 years old and the roof is beginning to leak a little bit and there's a bit of subsidence. And I think that is a, a description, a fit description uh, for our democracy. So if you take, for instance, first past the post, well, first past the post really probably dates back to 1950. And what's interesting uh, is that actually before 1950, some members were, of parliament were elected under an STV system. 
uh, astonishing for the UK. And, and it, uh, I guess it, it dispels uh, the myth, for instance, that uh, we couldn't possibly do something like STV because we have this tradition of first past the post. Well, first past the post actually only exists, exists since 1950. And prior to that, there were seats, as I said, that were elected under STV. Uh, as or I, I guess everyone on this call know, uh, unfortunately, our, our system of first past the post is one that we, uh, along with other things, exported uh, to our empire. Uh, and uh, sensibly, many of those countries have moved on, but we haven't. Uh, New Zealand and Australia, for instance, have moved on. Uh, unfortunately, others haven't, but uh, certainly we haven't. We're still very much stuck with that system. And House of Lords. Uh, House of Lords probably in its present form uh, dates back to 1911, uh, which is the point at which the House of Lords could no longer reject legislation. But really it hasn't undergone much change since then. Uh, certainly the uh, sort of contradiction in terms that is the election of hereditary peers uh, hardly counts as a substantial reform of the House of Lords. So that I think is that those are the, the, the services that, that uh, are, I think, uh, corroded uh, within the, the house uh, that is our democracy. Now, at this point, the, the house analogy falls down a little bit because I now need to briefly touch on, on dark money, which is something that Peter, Peter talked about. Clearly, uh, that's not something that has necessarily been around, certainly not in terms of uh, funding that, that's going into things like Facebook ads, hasn't been around for 70 years. But it's worth briefly touching on that. Uh, I was been doing some work with uh, Open Democracy and the Mirror. Uh, the Mirror and, and Open Democracy have been looking at the the non-party organisations that uh, funded to the tune of seven hundred thousand pounds of adverts, Facebook adverts, uh, against basically against Jeremy Corbyn was, was their target. And I think what was interesting to, for, for me is that as the government minister who was responsible for bringing forward aspects of the transparency and non-party uh, lobbying bill, uh, which, I mean, I have differences of opinion with some of the, the, the charity sector and so on about the intent of that. But one, one thing that was very clear about that uh, bill and now uh, act is that it was trying to address it was trying to stop the development of the super PACs that you see in the US. That was the purpose of the bill. I was the minister, I was being, that, that is what I was trying to achieve through that. And the looking back at the notes from that bill, it was very clear that the expectation, for instance, was that there would be no, uh, the only organizations that would not be receiving uh, donations of, uh, 700,000 uh, pounds or more. The only ones that wouldn't receive donations of that size were going to be small organizations. And those are the organizations therefore that wouldn't have to report their donations. But some of these organizations uh, that uh, I, I talked about that were spent collectively spent 700,000 pounds on Facebook ads, uh, were spending 60, 65,000 uh, pounds per organization. And they're not small organizations, yet not a single one of those 12, I think it was, declared a single donation above seven and a half thousand pounds. Now, as someone who fought eight general elections and Clive and, and possibly Natalie will be familiar with this, if you're trying to raise a, a significant sum of money to fight an election campaign, particularly if you are doing it in the last three months before the election, which is what these organizations were doing, you don't raise 60,000 pounds from five pounds here and there. You tend to raise it from large donations. And the fact that 700,000 pounds managed to be raised without a single donation over seven and a half thousand pounds, frankly, uh, I don't believe to be true. And that's why working with Open Democracy uh, and uh, the Mirror, we have contacted the, the Electoral Commission and asked them to investigate it because we simply don't believe uh, that this is true. And certainly it wasn't expected that that would happen when this bill was being debated uh, sort of 10, 10 years ago or so. So just to come to, a, to perhaps quickly to a, to a conclusion, uh, in terms of what we need to, what we need to do to uh, 
uh, sort of get this, this massive reconstruction project underway in terms of our democracy, where well, we need to do the same sort of thing that needs to happen in relation to the restoration and renewal project for the Palace of Westminster, which is to start with the foundations. And incidentally, if that project doesn't start soon, there's a real risk that our Palace of Westminster will burn down. And I think that from our democracy's point of view, whilst perhaps some might join the crowds on the, the, Thames, the, 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 you know, the, the Thames Riverbank to, to acclaim uh, the burning down of our parliament, I suspect that actually for our democracy, it would not be a particularly good image. So we need to start with the foundations and that means a fair voting system uh, that and, and unlocked democracy isn't prescriptive about what type of fair voting system, uh, but a fair voting system and first past the post clearly wouldn't qualify in that respect. It means reform of the House of Lords. And again, the way in which that's done, um, that would be something that perhaps through a, a deliberative process, citizens assembly, we would we, the, the public would draw their own, own conclusions about what type of uh, reform to the House of Lords, but an unelected House of Lords clearly would not uh, be acceptable. More transparency and accountability of government. Now, the some of you will have read that the government are proposing setting up this special agency with public money, ARIA as it's called. Uh, they're going to spend £800 million of taxpayers' money on setting up this public organisation, and they are going to exclude it from the list of bodies subject to FOI. And I can only draw one conclusion as to why they're going to do this, and that is because we know that uh, Dominic Cummings was suggesting that uh, huge amounts of taxpayers' money should be spent on a company that wanted to place satellites in low orbit, to replace the system that we're going to lose as a result of leaving the European Union. And all the evidence points to the fact that that is going to be a huge financial black hole and will not provide the technical benefits uh, that uh, one would expect. And I can only suppose that the government are going to use this agency to uh, bring forward uh, the latest pet project that a minister or a special advisor might have and don't want it to be subject to any scrutiny. And that's 800, pound, 800 million pounds worth of taxpayers' money uh, that will not be open to scrutiny. So we need to a fair voting system, transparency, transparency and accountability of government. That means, for instance, that the, um, that the prime minister who has failed to enforce the ministerial code, can't, it cannot be left in his hands. And incidentally, it suffers a major lacuna, which is that uh, the ministerial code applies to the prime minister uh, and therefore the prime minister would be expected to apply the ministerial code to himself uh, if he was in, in breach of it and clearly uh, it's very unlikely that uh, he would want to do that so uh, accountability means the ministerial code can't be left in the control of, of the prime minister. Uh, deliberative democracy will be key to this in terms of uh, improving the trust I think that exists between the public and uh, politicians, devolution, uh, some work that Unlock Democracy are paying for from one of our universities is looking at how local authorities have seen their powers reduced over the last 40 years and what impact that has had on our local democracy. And finally, my, my final uh, sort of few words about the written constitution. Now, if we overhaul uh, that rather dilapidated, dilapidated house in the way that I described in terms of uh, a new roof, uh, proper proper services deal with the subsidence then what you need at the end of that process is a written guarantee that that house is going to stay in that condition thereafter and that is where uh, the written constitution comes in so it guarantees things like that the fair voting system would remain it guarantees things like that the house of lords would be uh, an elected chamber it guarantees that the, uh, no prime minister could ever come forward and propose uh, shutting down Parliament against Parliament's will. So that is what the written constitution uh, would, would do, provide that guarantee. And that and the other issues that, that I've talked about are the sorts of issues that Unlock Democracy campaigns on. And uh, thank you for giving me the chance the, this evening to set out uh, what we're up to as an organisation.
That's wonderful. Thank you, Tom. It's brought lots of questions for me. I want to know all about what you think about voter ID that's being proposed. I want to know all that you think about local elections coming up this year and the COVID rules and how that will impact little parties, um, none of which we'll address now. Um, but we do have a QA and a um, here. And if everyone would like to add their questions to the Q&A while we're listening to our next speaker, we will come round to them at the end. Uh, but thank you very much, Tom. And I'd like to introduce um, Clive, who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I am anyway. So Clive is a Labour MP from Norwich South. Prior to that, he's been Vice President of the National Union of Students. You see, these are things I didn't know. Until long time, I long time ago. That. <laughs> last year, he was President of the National Union of Students, Vice President, BBC you where you've gone far. Political reporter and an army reservist infantry officer serving a combat tour in Afghanistan in 2009. Clive is chair of the APPB, APPG, or the All Party Parliamentary Group on Race and Community, and co chair of the APPGs on Green New Deal and Future of Work. So, uh, Clive, your right of reply is, uh, is coming up now. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate that. And it's lovely to be here tonight um, to take part in this. And I, I say right of reply, I mean, I, my, I'm going to talk broadly about uh, the kind of the Christ of democracy. Um, and I don't know whether I'll disagree with anyone. Maybe I'll disagree as to the kind of some of the kind of the urgency. But I think we're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet tonight, or at least I, I think we will be. Um, so the theme today is democracy under fire. Um, but I would say maybe it's more accurate to say democracy is on fire. Uh, a torch is being taken to what? are very modest and limited democratic gains that have been made in the last couple of hundred years uh, in this country. Now, if I'm being honest, I look around and I see too many progressives in my party, in other parties, and in the wider social movement, turning up to the blazing inferno with a watering can, and some aren't showing up at all. And I think we need to get real about the challenges before us, the systemic change demanded, and the collective action required. Now, if we can't do that, then I'm afraid to say that we're probably going to be left squabbling over ashes. I don't mean to be too dramatic, but I, I think, you know, given, as I will explain in, in the talk, where we are, I think this is, is, is quite accurate. So what I want to do after tonight for your consideration is a diagnosis of why the health of our democracy is ailing. And we need to get this right so we can prepare and deliver the right antidote. And I'm gonna spend you know, the next 10 minutes or so that I have talking about the nature of the democratic crisis as I see it, and the democratic transformation that I think is proportionate to the scale of the challenge. So some of you may have heard me speak before as an, an advocate of proportional representation and, and codified constitution, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I didn't come into politics because I had a burning desire to see a wider variety of colored rosettes at elections. The aspiration of being able to wave around a hard copy of a written down constitution is not what gets me out of bed in the morning, if I'm being really honest. In fact, if that's all I managed to achieve during my time as an elected representative, I consider it a failure. Uh, for me, the motivation to come into politics was to defend the very moderate gains already made, such as social housing, comprehensive schooling, and, and higher education as a public good, and, building them, and build on them for a deeper, transformative structural change. Elections and codified documents can only ever be parts of a whole. Important part, sure, I wouldn't be here talking about Democracy Day if it was otherwise, but democracy at its very core is about giving people power in both their everyday lives as well as in the workplace. And for me, that means political and economic power, the power to participate and make decisions about the issues that affect you in politics, in the workplace, the two are indivisible. And we are in a crisis of democracy because our institutions and systems have failed people. It doesn't start with Boris Johnson or Brexit. It doesn't even start with the financial crisis of 2008, the expenses scandal, or the Iraq war. So let's not mistake symptoms for causes. Uh, I think that the cause is fundamentally that our political system was not set up to function as a democracy. Democratic features have been stapled onto this elective dictatorship, as a former Conservative Lord Chancellor, Lord Helsham called it. You know, he's not exactly a radical socialist, he's a member of the establishment, but even he could see what it was. Therefore, I think that the nature of this democratic crisis means that we must collectively prioritise the transformation of the whole instead of tinkering at the edges. So allow me to set out what I think the bigger picture here really is. The threats facing humanity this century are existential. Uh, Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, considers himself an optimist when it comes to the future. He put our chances of survival 
in the next century, i.e. this century, it was next century when he wrote it last century, surviving this century at 50-50. If these were uh, your odds going into the surgery, uh, you'd probably have your winning order and you'd probably have said your goodbyes to your nearest and dearest. The pandemic has been devastating. Uh, we're living through it now. Over a million people around the world have died. Millions more have been infected and many are living with long-term health conditions. Existing inequalities have been entrenched, both domestically and internationally, while public procurement has become a get-rich quick scheme for the government's cronies. We're also in the middle of an ecological breakdown, which scientists have linked to the emergence of COVID-19. Biodiversity is collapsing. Our food chains are collapsing, and many, and many, and many, specific, many species have been wiped out uh, are on the brink of extinction. This is made worse by the climate crisis. And even though the cause has now been known for decades, there has been an international failure to take the action required because of the mass consumer consumerism and deregulation demanded by free market ideology, which puts profiteering before public good. We're also experiencing the rise of AI and surveillance capitalism, where democracy is seen by big, big tech companies as an obstacle to competing with Chinese firms which benefit from the Chinese state's lax, uh, lax uh, regulations. This is the crisis of democracy because at the heart of these problems is the failure of our established institutions and political system as a whole to represent the public, to challenge economic self-interest in favor of the common good. The economic liberalization of the last 40 years, actually let's scrap that, let's call it what it is, a deliberative, a deliberate and systemic uncoupling of democratic will over the economy and our collective ability to control the power of capital. But how else can we explain the phenomena of so-called liberal democracies destroying the very life support system that keeps us alive simply to enrich a small minority? Makes no sense. In fact, there's a valid argument to be made that we never really had complete democratic control over these vested interests in some mythical age past. What we've had is merely a sliding scale of the illusion of control. Once the climate and ecological crisis, one the climate and ecological crisis has blown a vast hole through. It's therefore clear to me the past 40 years has gone hand in hand with a retreat of even our limited democracy. And this has brought about a new gilded age and the mass accumulation of wealth and power. And that power is increasingly unaccountable. Peter himself earlier touched upon how via information and data, they're attempting to hold on to that power and entrench that power. So which for which so this brings me to me the basic definition of a progressive, someone I can work with to take on those vested interests, irrelevant of the party or the background. And it's this, do you believe in more democracy, not less? And are you prepared to reduce, not manage, but reduce the power of capital? If yes to both answers, and I think we can do business. And I think that's a pretty broad, and given the cliff edges we face, a pretty inclusive definition. And this is why the only answer to the democratic crisis for me is, democratic transformation that will lead to uh, an inevitable economic one. And that is a bigger picture where I see creating a new constitution for the UK and changing our electoral system fitting in. Because there's nothing about having a codified constitutional proportional representation that will create the transformed democracy I think we need. Yes, writing and codifying a new constitution is a basic requirement for democracy. But this process done democratically and harnessing tech for good is also an opportunity to think about the kind of state we need to meet the challenges we face. What kind of state do we want as a vehicle for equality and freedom for all? How we redistribute and decentralize power, including how to remedy the present implications of the UK's colonial past. And yes, proportional representation is the way we realize uh, the basic requirement for fair and equal votes. But we must also see this as an opportunity to renew our political culture, to, delete, to deepen collaboration, consensus building, and inclusivity, and to make sure that in responding to the challenges we face, those who are systematically excluded, alienated, and discriminated against by our current institutions are put in the driving seat. So how do we, be, how do we bring about this democratic transformation in the face of such enormous challenges? I think we need to get out of the 19th century party political silos that aren't fit for the 21st century challenges. That's why I look to the, to the uh, road 2024. It's one, of, it's one that must be paid by electoral packs and the building and formation of progressive alliances. And I say this to those in my party, if anyone here tonight is listening to this, that must mean giving up the aspiration held by some to impose socialism from above and moving beyond laborism, that ridiculous idea that the Labour Party is the only vehicle for progressive change. But for those of a liberal persuasion, that means confronting 
an instinct to think of democracy in terms of merely institutions and representation alone. So very quickly to conclude, I'm gonna finish by saying that I think there's a very clear choice in front of those of us who want to see a democratic future. Either we start working together, we identify areas of common cause that will form the basis of an electoral pact that will elect a progressive government at the next election and open up the way for a radical and transformative democratic and economic change. Or we can pin our hopes on the failed political system of the 20th century, producing the solutions to the problems that it created in the first place. Wow. Thank you, Clive. That's um, cheered me up. I would like to work with you, <laughs> most certainly. And it is certainly what we're trying to achieve from the Bylines Network, which is apolitical, cross-political. We bring in everyone from the progressive sphere. And if we have your definition of, do you want more democracy and reduce the power of capital? Uh, we might just have to change our logo for the Bylines Network and just get everyone to sign up to say yes. But I think you've um, set the scene nicely for our final speaker of the night. And just to say, we wouldn't normally have four speakers. When we reached out to our speakers tonight, everyone said yes, <laughs> which was very wonderful. And we thought we'll extend it by 15 minutes so we can accommodate all four. And then um, Kleiner Jordan was unable to make it. And uh, my huge thanks to Natalie Bennett for stepping in at the last minute. So as a quick introduction for you, Natalie, Natalie is a lifelong green and feminist. She is a, we wrote this for you, you didn't write this, so you might want to, again, write a reply. She's the leader of the um, Green Party from 2012 to 2016 and is now a member of the House of Lords. Uh, she can obviously reply to um, earlier comments on whether you want to be uh, staying in that position. Natalie was editor of The Guardian Weekly from 20, uh, 2007 to 2012. She is currently co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong. Born and raised in Australia, she began her career as a journalist with regional papers back in New South Wales. Over to you, Natalie. If any of that's wrong, please do say. Well, thank you very much, Louise. And no, that's absolutely right. Although I think in uh, joining Tom and Clive in congratulating the Bylines Network in its growth and rapid expansion, um, I might add to that that I also, I've just looked it up, I started being a blogger in July 2004. And the first time I actually appeared on national television, uh, it just happened to flash past, I, I saw the blog post on it, uh, it was the it was April 24, 2006. And it wasn't for the Green Party. It was on Sky Television. Uh, and it was, um, they had this, this hour long show where they talked to this weird new species called bloggers. And every time they introduced bloggers, they had to define what a blogger was. So I'm sure, uh, you know, that will seem like ancient history and it feels like ancient history to lots of your contributors, but you know, that's some of the early history of things that led towards bylines. But when I, when I was invited onto this panel, I thought there was something of a risk that um, we might, you know, these panels, sometimes it's all people agreeing with each other. Uh, but I'm glad to see that we've got a gradation here. And I am going to start by, to some degree, disagreeing with what uh, both Tom and Clive have said to start off with, because uh, Tom said, we've got to fix our democracy. And Clive said, we have a limited democracy uh, or we have democratic features uh, buttoned on to what's essentially a feudal system. Um, I would say the UK is not a democracy. And I evolved towards that through a whole series of spending many years going to public meetings as Green Party leader, you know, saying to people variations of what Tom and Clive just said, oh, our democracy is broken, we've got to fix it. And then eventually it struck me one day that actually, you know, if we take the, the last election 2019, the Conservative Party got 44% of the vote and 100% of the power. And that does not fit a democracy by any definition. And if you also look at the way in which London, well, actually, Sean Berry will be, will be after me when I say London. Westminster dominates the rest of the country. Uh, and it is Westminster, you know, the parliament there. We, we, let's not blame the people of Tower Hamlets or the, or the, or the people of uh, South East London. Um, Westminster dominates the rest of the country so much that people have no real say about what happens about where houses are built in their community. So the UK is not a democracy. And picking up the House of Lords point, um, uh, you know, I went into the House of Lords with the explicit intention of abolishing my own job as soon as possible. Uh, and one of the first things I did was actually, uh, after I made my maiden speech, was go up to the bill office holding my elections and other reforms House of Lords bill. Um, though I guess since I'm here replacing um, Cleaner, I, I will sort of say from the Make Votes Matter position, I know that they're somewhat concerned Make Votes Matter is focused entirely on getting a fair 
proportional electoral election system for the commons um, on the basis you you get vote for what you want and you get it every vote counts um, and they were a bit concerned that people could be fobbed off by just getting a reform of the house of lords um, although my answer to that is that actually if you did that um, you would have a situation that the house of lords you would immediately have an enormous larger constitutional crisis than we've got now because the house of lords would have greater democratic legitimacy than the commons would and that would be a profoundly unsustainable situation but no so so just to sort of finish off on our metaphor and come around in a circle with tom said you know what sort of house was it like well i think we're more like a sort of norman moton bailey castle the peasants have been drafted in to, to chuck up to build that build that mound and they've stuck a wooden structure on top and that's about what we've got in terms of our non-democracy um, and you know, there's so much we need to change, but one of the things, one of the real challenges is how do we go about it? And I think bouncing off what, what Clive was saying, you know, COVID is a product of our ecological crisis, what we've done to the planet. Uh, but what we also need to do while seeing all the tragedy, the disaster, the suffering is seeing that COVID has taught us as one lesson, which is it's possible to change things really, really quickly. It's possible to make massive sudden changes in ways that no one predicted weeks or months beforehand. Um, and I think we need to take that as a positive sign. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, oh, it's going to take so long. And, you know, maybe we can elect a parliament in 2024 um, that will be a, a PR majority parliament. And we, we gradually, you know, but we have a profoundly broken system. I was once at a meeting actually with them. Um, make votes matter with um with, with someone from the electoral reform society who you know it's been around for a very long while and kind of might be described as rather fixed in his ways and this was a few years ago now and um he was saying oh you know i think i think we've got to uh, we've got to uh, we've really got to wait for the political crisis and then we've got to have exactly the right system all worked out to present with a political crisis and there's probably some marks underneath the chair where I was hanging onto the chair, restraining myself from going, political crisis, what do you think we're in now? But a political crisis, and that was a few years ago, and we're still very clearly continuing that political crisis. Uh, one of the books that I always recommend to people is a great little book by a professor called Stein Ringen, Nation of Devils. And it was written about a dozen years or so ago now, um, uh, and basically said the US and the UK are not democracies and they're more or less ungovernable in their current structures. And I'd have to say that looks like a pretty prescient book to have written a dozen years ago. And one of the other interesting things, and again, this is lessons from COVID. One of the things he points out is that um, not only is a first past the post system, a majoritarian system, profoundly undemocratic, um, it also produces just objectively a really lousy quality of governance. The quality of decision making that you're making, independent of whatever the ideology is, is just really, really poor. And one of the reasons for that is you have a seesaw situation. So you have a Labour government brings in, say, a whole lot of shore start centres. You have a Tory government whose main aim is to undo everything the Labour government did. And they go in the other direction. All those people who built up those centres, who learnt those skills, all that infrastructure is lost. And you, you see that also with the extreme of that with um, Donald Trump, who if there was one coherent part of Donald Trump's ideology, it was to undo everything that Obama had ever done. And that's the one coherent line that you can run through the whole uh, of, tr of Trump. Um, so you, we can deliver change. And you know, the real question is how, and I'll, I want to devote a couple of minutes to that because I do believe that Q&A and dialogue is better than monologue. So I'll try not to monologue for too long. But the chief message I'd ask everyone to take away, and, and in a way I feel like I don't have to do this to this audience, say this to this audience, but let's really pin it down. I say this when I talk to schools and colleges and universities and I'll pitch it at groups or anything. My top line of message is politics should be what you do, not have done to you. Now, by, if you're a bylines contributor or thinking about being a bylines contributor, if you're reporting what's happening in your local community, what's happening in your area, what you see happening around you, that's doing politics. But doing politics can be you, even simpler than that. Organising a litter pick, socially distanced litter pick now, um, saying this is our public space, we want to look after it. That's a political action. When I'm taken into schools and, and people say, oh, you're saying do politics, what do you mean? And I say to the pupils, right, well, get together, sit down with your friends and see what you don't like about how the schools run and then start a campaign to change it. At which point the teacher who invited me goes, oh, what have I done? But 
this is what we have to do is empower everyone to get involved and engaged. And that's why one of the really exciting things that's happening is we're seeing a huge rise in participatory democracy, citizens' assemblies. We had the climate assembly that unfortunately sort of got swept aside in terms of coverage um, with, by COVID. But there's huge numbers of, of assemblies coming up in local communities. And this idea of participatory democracy, deliberative democracy, not just a simple referendum where you vote on an impossibly complicated question with a yes or no answer, but where you have a representative group of people from around the country or around the region, wherever it is in your city, even in your suburb, um, representative group of people by age, by gender, by BAME background, all the rest of it, get them together, give them the knowledge, give them the information, give them the chance to, to talk each other and discuss. And it's really being proven to work really well as a decision-making method. And you know, what I would say is how do we draw up the new written constitution? And I very much agree with Clive that we need a written constitution. Although my argument is perhaps a little bit different because I think there are so many ridiculous aspects of our current constitution. You know, um, The Guardian's just been highlighting again uh, the way in which the queen and the heir to the throne actually have an incredibly large impact on legislation, despite the supposedly purely, purely ceremonial role. Um, if you wrote down, the heir to the throne shall have the right to scribble in spidery black ink all over every bit of legislation before anyone else sees it. If you wrote that down, the ink would fly off the page in incredulity. If you wrote down our current constitution, people would just laugh. So we need a people's constitutional convention, a genuinely representative group of people. We could have a whole national conversation on social media. That's where the blogging in the bylines network comes back in. Um, have a huge conversation on social media. The country discusses, decides what our new constitution should look like, how we get a functional government system. We come together and we create that change. And I can't tell you exactly how that's gonna happen, but it's crucially important that it does because I would say that you know our side of politics broadly, our progressive side of politics needs, wants, encourages people to be empowered to feel like they can take control of their own lives. The other side, the far right, wants people to feel disempowered, beaten down, so that the person, the leader comes riding up on the big white horse and everyone just follows them along and they lead them wherever, wherever the person on the horse leads to. And that's not what we're, talk we're talking about. We're talking about everyone being in involved, engaged and having a say. And that I would say is democracy. It's nothing like what we have now, but it's something that we have to work to. And you know, if you invite me to come and talk about algae, if you invite me to talk about climate change or the biodiversity crisis, I will come back to democracy because these, the answers to poverty, to inequality, all of it ultimately comes back to democracy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Natalie. That um, that ruins our next talk, which was going to be on algae, and we'd already got the speakers lined up. So, thanks for that. No, thank you very, very much. We have a Q and A session now. I, I appreciate. I think Clive needs to leave early. Um, do just shout when you when you need to. Yeah. Um, and I just want to bring um, Alex into the room, who has been hiding in the background. Hi, Alex. Alex has organised tonight's um, event. Um, and has also been monitoring some of the questions and the chat. So Alex, have you got a first question for us? It might be for the whole panel or it might just be for one in particular. We'll see how that goes. You'll need to, do I need to invite you to unmute? I think I can do it myself, okay. I reckon. Yeah, there we go, brilliant. Um, yeah, so I'll start with Clive given you got to head off a bit early. Um, really interesting question from Peter kind of saying, all this is all well and good. We all, most of us here support some kind of constitutional reform but it's really difficult to get it onto the agenda. So what can we kind of do to make this seem like an issue which affects people's lives that they really care about? So I think, I mean, how I have approached this, you know, if you listen to, for example, the Extinction Rebellion, you know, they're talking about democratic change through the lens of the climate crisis, you know? So I, I there, you know, if you, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that, yes, if we're simply gonna talk about this as a, a, a functional, kind of, we need a constitution, we need a fair voting system. These things I think are self-evident. Um, we need to make the case, but actually you talk about the fact that the, the symptoms that not having them that are being that are coming are coming about because of that, that's the politics that people understand. And I, I think one of the things we often tend to do, and in our own party, you know, it, we're looking like we're actually going to, for the first time, have a debate on 
our voting system. You know, I, I think around about 30% of um, CLPs now have voted to make this a priority ballot. We're working really hard to make that happen. And, you know, usually most years you will get people popping up. We will, we will get this, but you'll get a lot of people popping up and say, well, there are other priorities. The NHS is the priority. The climate crisis is the priority. You know, it's like, I think people understand after the series of defeats that we faced, on Brexit, on a Tory government elected on, on a minority of the, of the electorate, and so on and so forth, De defeat after defeat, that people now begin to see that these are actually symptoms and that there is actually something underpinning that, which is that our democracy is broken, our democracy is on fire. Um, and that, so I think that's, the, so inside our party, and I think outside, there is a conversation to be had with the public, which is, can we, env can we envision a different country where people have control over their lives, where people can actually take back control for themselves, their family, their community, to have more decisions in their life, on, uh, on, on every aspect of their life, including in the workplace. And I think if you do that, I think you can sell this to people, you can sell it to the public, um, and it doesn't have to be boring and dry. It actually can be a, you know, something that we can, we can express and get people on board with. Thank you. Does any of our other panel want to comment on how we get people enthused about this? Natalie? One of the things, just looking also at the, the uh, comments in the chat, um, there's been very little national coverage, partly because no one pays any attention to local government, but there are at least um, 18 um, rainbow coalitions of local um, principal local authorities around the country um, that in, those are the ones involved Greens. There's probably more too. So we're seeing you know, a broad range of people coming together to actually run councils up and down the country. And this is something perhaps that the, um, the bylines um, network people who've got that sort of council might like to have a look at in terms of the broader sense, because what you're actually doing is modeling a continental European style, PR style government uh, running of local councils. This is, this is something that's already happening and change is happening, but because it's at the level of local government and our national media pays almost no attention to, lo to local government, um, this has just kind of gone under the radar. But you know, th there is real political change happening out there. And one of the interesting things is, I mean, one of the ones I happen to know about is Herefordshire County Council, um, which will probably come under your new central uh, bylines uh, area. Well, um, and um, you know, that's a rainbow coalition. And that used to be, you know, everyone would have said it will be Tory until you know forever, and, and, and until hell freezes over. Um, and basically, what happened was Greens came from one side. Um, a, a group of independents came from the other and there's a few um, Labour and Lib Dem and now they're running the council. Um, and that's in a place, you know, Herefordshire County Council, you'd never predict. So, you know, there's lots of also grassroots change happening that's kind of just under the radar because only everyone only ever looks at Westminster and, you know, maybe occasionally at Holyrood and the Senate. Tom. Just, just briefly, I think part, it's partly about language. So I think using the term codified constitution amongst this group is fine. People will understand what we're talking about. Uh, but that's why I use instead this analogy about, in effect, a house insurance policy. So your written constitution is the, the insurance policy that guarantees that other aspects of your house don't fall down. And it's about trying to, 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 to find ways of putting it in language that is, uh, that is perhaps more readily understood than the terminology that we use uh, on uh, on webinars like this so that and that's a challenge which I think all all organizations in the democracy sector face about converting it into something that people can can make a connection with their uh, their everyday life with. Peter what do you think is the role of the media in this and, and Byline Times I know with Byline's network we try and write articles that are accessible to a broad range of people it doesn't do, it's not always very easy to do that but what do you do at Byline Times to make sure that what you're saying is actually accessible to a broad range of people? Yeah, I mean, I think what's great is this iterative process where the Bylines Network does it better, where people step forward, they debate, they come up with ideas and they form this coalition, this common language. It goes back to my tradition back in French theatre, which is that art of collaboration. Um, and that, that has deep sort of profound effects. Violent times we're mainly exposing the bad guys, you know, so we expose the PP stuff like that. But no, it is, it, and also what we do encourage is we have Pope Peter Obon writing for us now. I don't know the political affiliations of various writers. I know they come from the sort of Corbynite left, the Greens, or Lib Dem support, and I don't care because, um, you know, if they're on point about the point of accuracy, if they're putting forward ideas to share in the public domain, you know, it really 
that that sort of sexual infighting is what gets us where we are. The right is much, much better, isn't it? Because there's lots of money involved. There's an oligarch in the background who will instill discipline for not doing that. But I think, yeah, the, you know, the fighting over who is the most liberal, who's the most progressive has to be overcome. And I just love the word violence. I have no idea of the affiliations of the people who write for you. They just seem to want to tell the truth and seem to want to cooperate. Okay, thank you. Um, Fiona has asked, listening to Clive and his ambitions, there's a feeling among people, such as on Twitter, that there's no political home. Uh, this isn't necessarily directly at Clive, this is, this is generally here. Uh, so the question is whether we think there should be a new political party which all opposition parties should join in coalition. I have a feeling the answer to that might be no, but let's just see what the, uh, the panellists say on that. Um, Natalie, do you want to take that one first? Okay, well, first, yes, I'm, I'm probably the right person to answer this, given, you know, uh, the Green Party, it took us roughly 40 years to get our first MP, you know, forming a new political party in the UK is a very difficult task. Um, I think, you know, the answer is, if we actually look at you, know, we're talking about proportional representation, we're talking about a fair voting system. If you look at European systems, you know, you're talking about a minimum of six to eight parties to get a fair representation, so most people end up with the party they vote for. Um, so trying to form one overarching thing is just going really big on first past the post models, essentially. And what you have is a coalition within that party, and that means things are actually much less um, transparent and much less obvious um, than the way they are now. You know, I think what we have to do is, um, is transform our politics. Um, and I saw actually there was a question in the chat, someone was saying, but what about independence? Well, I'm personally very much a believer in parties, because I think the problem with independence is... Uh, there was a case a few years ago in um, Westminster um, where there was a very nice, very good man uh, was elected as a save our local hospital candidate. Um, and, you know, he was a doctor in the hospital, great person. But, you know, if you have very strong feels about, feeling about foreign policy, how on earth do you know how that person's going to vote? Um, how do you know as an independent, what do they stand for? What's their great political philosophy? You know, unless you can sit down with them and chat for two hours and decide, well, that's the person who best represents my needs. A party tells you where people are positioned and people have to work together in politics. So I don't think the problem is part the parties. The problem is we don't have a system that allows a sufficient range of parties. And one of the things that's been happening, I think, in, in places like um, particularly Holland in particular, is the, the trend in, in continental Europe is to have more and more parties so people can really vote for what they feel like. And those parties then you know, get together and deliver as much of their manifesto as they can, um, having given the voters a sense of what their priorities are. And that means you know, people are getting what they want, getting the representation they want. Tom, what do you think? pretty much uh, agree with Natalie really. I think the difficulty with forming a new party uh, is that um, the, the, the recent track record of success uh, is not very impressive. I mean, you'll remember a certain number of M Labour MPs left the Labour Party with a view to forming a new party, in fact, uh, and, and other MPs left the Conservative Party. Uh, and and uh, the reality is that in the present first-past-the-post system, it is very, very difficult for a, a party to emerge and to uh, secure anything like uh, a share of power. So I think, as Natalie was saying, actually, it's about trying to uh, change our system so that we can have a, a, a range of political parties represented, rather than perhaps an artificial scenario where a party like the Conservative Party uh, has within it probably five or five or six different factions uh, and the Labour Party uh, to the same extent perhaps and and the other parties to a lesser extent because they're of a smaller size but I think we artificially force uh, politicians to stay within a large one of the two large parties because our system doesn't allow uh, other parties to emerge and it certainly doesn't allow with very few rare, ex rare exceptions independence to to get elected to, to Westminster at least. Thank you. Alex have you got a question lined up? Yes I do actually and I'm actually going to be a little bit naughty and sort of mould two questions into one. Um, so Deborah has asked kind of what what we think is going to happen um, because obviously Murdoch's approaching potential retirement, potential leaving the political sphere and what kind of happens when the Murdoch Empire starts to really collapse. And then also, um, Lizzie has kind of asked, um, 
social interaction has shrunk, we're looking much more on the kind of the online sphere. So kind of combine those two together, what do we think the future of particularly print media is looking like with Murdoch potentially leaving the picture and also social media becoming so much more important? Peter, that's for you. Yes, so, um, yeah, Rupert's old. Uh, he has begun to see power. Let's remember, he didn't, which was the whole aim of suppressing phone hacking in 2011, so he could take over the whole of Sky. Um, he tried again. He reinstated Rebecca Brooks, the editor of News of the World, who had not noticed most uh, deputies, and her deputy editor was phone hacking. Um, and he went back for that bid, but he failed. And the Murdoch reputation was tarnished by that. Um, his son, Lachlan, is not as charismatic as him. You know, a, dynasties are problematical because the children never have quite the drive of the dynast. And anybody who's watched Succession knows what I'm talking about. Um, but the problem is other people are moving to this space. We're seeing this in America, the OA network, all these various other TV stations trying to outfox Fox. We're watching that now with GB News, which is really, you know, actually well ahead of the Fox News plan, which I think is only online. So they, people have seen this as a very um, lucrative, powerful space. Murdoch was in a way the first big return of the oligarch and others want to emulate him, whether it be Russian, Ukrainian, American, or from Dubai. Uh, we have to bite back. So that's the, the, just on that social media. Well, that's where we start off, that's where I became a journalist, you know, a live tweeting a trial where byline.com, byline festival, byline times, now the bylines. It's all thanks goodness this amazing medium whereby actually one day, I think it's in 2015, Rupert Murdoch replied to a tweet I sent against him. I, we can, to a limited extent, force a two way exchange. It's no longer a one way street, a sort of mechanical monopolization of power like it, but it is. But the economics of it are highly fragile. Uh, we are, with Facebook, it's not a public space. As they discovered in Australia last week, they can boot you off. You know, a lot of people, the internet is Facebook. I mean, many more than Twitter. So we have to find other ways of meeting. Byline Times Network is, uh, Byline's network is another, is a great example of that. And I know you communicate and I know even if Facebook went offline, you'd find, and we have to, you know, then find how you beat the money because they will buy bots, they will buy sock puppets, they will boost their scores, they will use private investigators to try to tarnish you. And I do think we are many, they are few, that actually there is a massive decency in the British population that just needs to be activated. Byline Times always gets all the sort of, ah, oh, I found a newspaper at last. And I'm sure you're having the same effect. And it is perseverance, because one thing I will say finally on this is it's not sustainable, their route. Their route, you know, it's like the skirt herd immunity. Unless they think they're going to go back to a population of one billion and live like liege lords in a kind of layman's row. The, the process of democratic demands of people are much higher than in my youth. The mix of this country, it'd be 30% people of color uh, by in a few years time. You can't deny this sort of, in a way, everything they're fighting, which is a pretty, I know Natalie might not agree with me, but in terms of education, even in terms of health, my kids had a better, uh, and it wasn't just because of work in London, there were more possibilities. I don't think in social mobility in their careers, but the healthcare system. The education system was better than when I was a kid, thanks to the Blair Bound reforms. And they have very high expectations and very, very high concern for the planet of our consumers. We have to tap into them. Natalie, what, what about you? You've looked at the, or you've come from a, a media background and are now um, have, you know, adjusted very well to your blogging and the social media. Where, where do you see that going then when the murder empire collapses? Well, I mean, I've for a long time been a real optimist in this area and one of the things is you know every day the, the traditional large mainstream media has less and less impact and you know in some ways this fragmentation um these new setups are attempts to you know a break off bits to attempts to set up something new to go new zeitgeist because the old model is just so clearly broken and failed and you know it is an amazing thing that you can set up something like the byline network um you 
something that would have been utterly impossible 20 years ago. You just wouldn't have been able to reach an audience. It wasn't possible. And, you know, I, we can now organize, you know, greens across Europe, indeed, even greens across the world. Um, you know, I can go on Twitter, see a tweet in Portuguese coming out of Latin America or something, hit the translate button. I can interact with that person very simply, you know, the ability to organize, the ability to contact and network and build uh, networks around the world is amazingly vastly. And, you know, this partly comes from the fact that I was an early adopter. I mean, I was in Bangkok when the internet arrived and I went from um, having to spend about the equivalent of about 10 pounds on a three day old British paper, which might have been a telegraph because that was the only one that had arrived that week, um, uh, to being able to read the Sydney Morning Herald online before it had even hit the seats of Sydney that morning. Um, and so, you know, I've just seen what the possibilities, what the strengths there are to ordinary people. And, you know, if you happen to make the right, well, these days, let's say the right TikTok video that just catches the zeitgeist and includes the right things, and I'm not going to be able to tell you what they are because I don't understand TikTok at all, but I know it exists. Um, you know, you could have a far greater reach than Griffith Murdoch. Um, and that's, you know, an amazing possibility and amazing strength. You know, this can and should be the people's media. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember when MySpace was taking over the world. And I've got no doubt that Facebook will one day go the same way as MySpace went. Um, and, you know, just one final thing. Um, a few couple of years ago now, I was in um, Northern England having dinner with a group of young Greens, including some couple of 15-year-old boys. Um, and I said to them, oh, what social media do you use? And even this was a few years ago, so some of the current ones wouldn't have been around, but they were able to tick off the 10 different social media that they used for different purposes. And they had an extremely sophisticated understanding of how you use what media for what purposes to what reach what people. And that's the generation we've got coming through now with a real, you know, digital native is, is a stereotype, but it's, you know, there's a real understanding of how to use those systems, what they mean, how to critically think about them. And, you know, Rupert Murdoch or Lachlan Murdoch are never going to keep up with that. Tom, oh, and I have a question um, for you as well. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what Natalie has just said is that everyone who is a progressive should immediately film themselves and go on TikTok. I'm, I'm not sure that that would work for me, but um, maybe it's something we should all investigate. Uh, I think she's right that the old model uh, of newspapers is broken. Uh, that is clear. But my worry is what is replacing it, particularly on social media, because I think the big challenge we have is that it is, it is much harder to control. Um, you know, you might hate the print press, but at least you you know who is buying it. And and whereas with social media, frankly, because of the uh, the ability to vary the message according to the recipient, you, you really have no no feel for what people are receiving uh, at home and looking at on their phones. Uh, and I think that, for instance, the legislation is always years behind. So we know, for instance, the Electoral Commission have been calling for, I think, since 2007, for the, the digital equivalent of the imprint that you see on a political leaflet. So you know who the agent was, you've got an address, so if you've got a complaint, you can follow it up. Since 2007, the Electoral Commission have been trying to get the same thing on Facebook adverts of a political nature and have not yet succeeded. They've just started in Scotland, uh, so maybe that's something that, you know, we'll be able to point to. But while the legislation lags so far behind, uh, there is a real risk that uh, we've replaced something which is bad in terms of the print press with something which is far, far harder to control uh, in terms of social media. Yeah. Before um, Louise interjects, I will just say that as um, a member of the infamous Generation Z, Generation Z, TikTok does not speak for us in any way. <laughs> Or for you? <laughs> for us. For, okay, for us. Um, we have time, I think, for one, probably one more question. Um, I, I want to come back to um, the Electoral Integrity Bill, um, because we're looking at democracy. This was a, a question about democracy um, for, the, um, for tonight. Um, so what are the panel's views on voter ID laws, um, on the regulations that are being brought in for the local elections in May, which um, will mean no door-to-door leafleting is my understanding um, and specifically Sue in Spain would like to know um, whether we think this time round we'll be getting back to scrapping the 15-year rule so that um, Brits who live abroad can actually vote in 
our elections. Um, Tom, can I come back to you first? Sure. Well, first of all, voter ID laws, it's very clear that uh, it's trying to address a problem which doesn't really exist. Uh, but by implementing it, it will in effect disenfranchise a very large number of people. Uh, and what is particularly ironic is that, um, you know, the government are, are concentrating on that because of, of fraud, uh, alleged fraud. Uh, at the same time, they talk about uh, postal vote fraud. Uh, although, interestingly, as uh, Michael Gove apparently is, is seeking to hoover up postal votes in his own constituency, uh, which is against his own guidance, which uh, says that political parties shouldn't do that uh, because of the risk of postal vote fraud. So interesting when we have the cabinet office uh, a minister responsible not reading his own guidance. So voter ID, I, I think, is a... Uh, is a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. And I think that is, that, that is really worrying. The elections in May. Now, as I understand it, the government have, I think yesterday announced that actually campaigning will be allowed to take place, I think from the 8th of May, I believe. Uh, and you, my apologies. One of the, uh, and that is, very, that, that is very good news because of course the real worry was that the only beneficiary of a system that allowed more spending on social media and more spending on commercial delivery would benefit one party in particular, the one that had the largest funds, and clearly that was the Conservative Party. But as I understand it, that, that position changed uh, very recently. And finally, in terms of um, votes for uh, British citizens abroad, I think the one thing that could help uh, try to you know, force this through is something which Unlock Democracy supports as an organisation, and that is the idea of having MPs in the British Parliament who represent overseas constituencies, as happens in another of Euro a, a number of other European countries where they have MPs who can who can advocate for their citizens uh, living abroad uh, in their own in their own Parliament, and I think that would help uh, achieve what Sue is trying to to achieve. Thank you. It's actually quarter past, but I will ask you whether Natalie and Peter want to very quickly um, respond on those, or at least forget the local elections now. Tom's addressed that. But voter ID um, laws, Natalie. Okay, well, I'm just going to very quickly entirely agree with Tom about the overseas um, representatives. You know, it makes total sense. Um, and, you know, the government's not going to want to do it because it won't be there. People get elected, but we can certainly push on it. Voter ID is really important because it is imported from America. It is voter suppression. Um, it is government being utterly Trumpian. And you, one of the things that I think, I, I wanna, when I find time, I'm going to write a piece about, you know, we have a far right government. We have a government that actively wants to, is doing everything it can to suppress democracy in whatever democracy we might have. Um, and, you know, voter ID, I was in um, 2017 when they first started playing with this, you know, standing, um, on a polling station in Sheffield and what we saw was you know, lots of young people actually even though they, they'd only brought it in in 10 trial seat places or something coming in clutching their passports because they just sort of heard about voter ID and thought they'd have to do it um, and I had several people on that polling station to me oh do I need ID and most of them had I had to say yes would have gone away and not come back and you know, there was a young woman of perhaps 18 who came in and her mother came and said, oh, um, I came with her because she was really nervous because this was the first time she voted. And for lots of people, you know, it's an intimidating, difficult world out there. Voting's, you know, it's, it's a new thing you haven't done before. It's scary. Um, and anything that makes it more difficult, particularly something that actually explicitly aims to exclude the poor, the disadvantaged, those with less education, those with less, with less you know, opportunities, those with less paperwork in their lives. Um, it, is, it has to be absolutely tapped at every turn. And certainly that's what I'll keep doing. Thank you, Peter. I defer to Tom and Ashley, who know more about the space than I do. All I'd observe is if you want to write about the way a right-wing government do come to byline times, because we've actually got a series called The Rump Trumpocracy. And we've noticed this vote of suppression. So many ideas floated from the far right, the American Republican, so movement, so much money coming into places like the Henry Jackson Society, like the Free Schools Network. They draw money from these right wing foundations, or the Coke Brothers, those on the left. So, this 
is to be exposed. I think when people see it, when you say the name there, Trumpocracy, we saw where that ended. It's a very powerful way of, of ex exposing this government for what it is. Thank you. And I see lots of people in the chat saying thank you. Thank you for taking your time tonight to speak to us. I've really enjoyed um, the whole discussion. Thank you everyone for sticking with us and for a slightly longer than normal webinar. And um, apologies, I didn't get more answers out of Clive before he had to go, but uh, we'll quicken back in at some point, I'm sure. So thank you very much, everyone, and good night.